A Godric and Felix Story The Reckoning Written by Jordan Ellinger There is nothing quite like watching the torch-lit streets of a city that wants you dead receding into the night. From where Felix stood on the stern of the Dorabella, he could just make out the tiny orange dots moving up and down the docks as the city watch searched for them. Unfortunately for them, dozens of ships choked the busy harbor. There was no telling which one they'd gotten on. You must have made many friends among the peacocks for them to still be chasing you this late at night, said Captain DiVenzo, a portly old Tylean, who dressed as colorfully as he spoke. When Godric and Felix had dashed up the gangplank in the dead of night, he taken them on eagerly. The docks of Miragliano hadn't exactly been filled with men eager to make the dangerous voyage to Lustria, land of the man-eating lizard men, and he was desperate for paying passengers. Although Gatrek wasn't much of a sailor, his runax strapped over the shoulder had convinced Divenzo that he would be good for something. The Italian hadn't cared much that the city watch was in hot pursuit of them. After all, half the crew were probably wanted men. Ne'er seen the peacocks so upset, he said, spitting on the deck for emphasis. Felix sighed, remembering the drunken fight Godric had started at the Purple Sheep. Accusing a nobleman of cheating at dice likely nets you a night in jail. Cut off the hand for the same crime, and they turn out the whole city watch. Better you let them catch you, said Divenzo with a smirk. Most men choose the gale over the dark continent. The hangman's noose offers a cleaner death. He smiled, revealing yellow teeth. Now, senor, I go. I've got to whip these bastards into shape. Felix nodded, but continued to stare back at the city as Divenzo returned to the stern castle. Only a moment earlier he'd been glad to leave, but now he was sorry to see it go. Oh, Lustria. After having failed to find his doom in the north, Godric had abruptly stated that if nothing in the old world could kill him, then he'd try the new one instead. Their travels together had taken them everywhere from the seediest brothels in the border princes to the skies above the chaos wastes in an airship piloted by a mad engineer. But the thought of traveling to a continent where humans had only a mere foothold, and that the rest of the land was ruled by the ancient and mysterious Scaled Ones, scared Felix more than he liked to admit. Of course, he had little choice in the matter. As Gotrek's rememberer, he vowed to record a slayer's death in an epic poem, and it would be pretty difficult to do that from across the ocean. He turned away from the railing and found a nearby crate to sit on. The slayer was ensconced in their cabin, trying to spend as little time on deck as possible. Dwarves had no love for sea travel, and Gotrek less than most. There was no glory in a death at sea. He'd most likely be passed out in a hammock, the tankard of ale he'd taken with them when they fled the purple sheep dangling from his fingers. Felix envied the dwarf's ability to sleep wherever and whenever he chose. Instead of joining him, Felix decided to jot down a few notes on the day's events in the journal. Perhaps amputating Viscount von Korloff's arm over a set of loaded dice might marry a stanza or two in Gotrek's epic. He just freed his journal from his pack when the Dorabella lurched abruptly, and the sound of breaking lumber rent the air. He was thrown against the cabin wall, hitting hard enough that he dropped it. The precious book landed on its spine, and then flopped open, the wind fluttering its pages. Overhead, a scream ripped through the air as the sudden stop tore a sailor from the rigging and threw him into the ocean forty feet below. A lantern flew off its hook and smashed against the deck, spreading oil and fire in its wake. Overhead, lines snapped out and the mast groaned. The sails were full, but the ship had stopped dead. Still struggling to catch his breath, Felix snatched up the journal and quickly shoved it back into his pouch. He'd spent months writing in the God's Be Damned thing. He wasn't about to see it flip overboard. More cries of alarm sounded, and then Divenzo began roaring orders at the top of his lungs. The captain strode among the crew, cursing and clubbing them back into some semblance of discipline. He sent some to help the poor bastard who'd gone into the sea, 
and then directed others to beat at the spreading flames from the overturned lamp with their surcoats. Felix hesitated, wondering if he should join them. Fire was every sailor's nightmare, but it was nothing that these men hadn't seen before. Under the Venzo's watchful eye, they formed a human chain with one man at the end lowering buckets into the ocean by means of a rope. Instead, he decided to investigate why the ship was not moving. What had they struck? If it was a sandbar, they could hopefully put one of the longboats and tow the schooner to freedom, before the sun rose and they were discovered. If it was a rocky shoal, they might all have to swim for shore. He wanted to find out which one before he woke the slayer. The ship lurched again. Wood cracked, and the rigging above Felix danced madly in the torchlight. A stack of crates slid against each other and tumbled to the deck, forcing him to leap to the side to avoid them. He found himself pressed up against the ship rail as the ocean surged and churned below him. Near the bow, a dark shape the size of a whale rose out of the waves, forcibly lifting the front of the Dorabella out of the ocean. Stunned, Felix couldn't help but stare at it. Silhouetted figures dashed along its spine, stopping at a cylindrical protrusion close to the bow. Metal shrieked as they swiveled it to face the ship. A flash and then a boom blossomed from it, revealing the low, sleek contours of a ship, but one that Felix had never seen before. Made from huge plates of riveted copper, it looked like a kettle had been crossed with a fish. Could this be some infernal scaven device for traveling beneath the waves? Their cunning knew no bounds. A spear point the size of Felix's head smashed into the side of the Dorabella. A cable attached to the spear grew taut, and the Tylean schooner lurched again as it was drawn close to the submersible. They were being boarded. Felix spun away from the railing, looking for Captain Divenzo. Despite the crew's best efforts, the fire had spread along the seams of tar between deck boards. Men still attempted to douse the flames with buckets of water, but the captain was nowhere in sight. Maybe he'd heard a crash and gone to investigate. Felix caught the arms of Alessio, the orphan who served as Divenzo's cabin boy, as he dashed by. Go below deck and awaken my traveling companion. Tell him we're being boarded. And be careful, he said as the boy dashed away. He's probably drunk. Felix watched him go and then set off in search of the captain. He found him close to the overturned crates at the rear of the vessel. Herr Jaeger, he called to Felix. Our cargo has shifted. If we don't get these crates to the bow, we're gonna take on water. Divenzo still thought they struck a sandbar. He'd been so concerned with keeping the ship afloat, he hadn't looked over the railing. You've got bigger problems, Captain, Felix shouted back. You're being boarded. Divenzo's eyes widened. He set down the crate he was carrying and dashed around the stern castle towards the bow, followed closely by Felix. Just as he arrived, a few strangled cries of alarm sounded from the sailors stationed there. Dark shapes moved across the deck, cutting men down where they stood. Forget the firemen, he roared, thrusting the scimitar into the air. Repel the boarders! A short but powerfully built figure clumped out of the shadows towards Felix, bellowing a war cry and hefting a huge maul. This was not a skaven, as Felix had initially suspected. It was a dwarf. Wait, I... he said, throwing his hands out. Before he could utter another word, the mole crashed down at him. He barely drew Karagul in time to parry, and the force of the blow shook his arm down to the bone. He tried a quick repast, and though the dwarf's strike had left him open, he was so heavily armored that Felix's blow drew sparks. Ineffective though it was, it caused the dwarf to take a step away, wary of another strike. Why were dwarves attacking a Tylian schooner? They were far from their holds in the World's Edge Mountains. There had to be some mistake. The dwarf darted in again and swiped at him with his hammer, a huge sweep that would have taken Felix's head clean off the shoulders. Instead, Felix stepped inside the blow and brought the pommel of his blade down on the dwarf's helmet, denting the metal and provoking a grunt of pain. The knees of the dwarf buckled and he began to drop. But just as Felix was about to turn in search of Godrek, he drove his shoulder into Felix's chest. They slammed into the ship's mast, and Felix slumped to the ground, crushed by the weight of a fully armored dwarf. His vision momentarily dimmed, 
and the enemy warrior raised a mole for the killing blow. There would be no parrying this time. Karagul had slipped from Felix's grip and lay on the deck a few feet away. He was unarmed. Wait! he yelled, throwing his hands in front of his face in a plea for mercy. I'm a dwarf friend! he shouted. The figure grunted hollowly. You're no friend of mine, he said, hefting his mole. Felix quickly scanned the deck, looking for something that could help, a rope, a weapon, but his eyes alighted on the backpack. Unattended, the fire had spread across the deck towards the mast, and now licked at the leather. His journal! Out of sheer desperation, he pushed off from the mast and launched himself at a dwarf. He caught the haft of the mole on his shoulder and felt it go numb, but he was still alive. Momentum carried him into his opponent. It was like hitting a wall of steel. Dwarves were obviously shorter than humans, but far stockier, and this one was solid muscle. Grabbing the haft of the mole, Felix kicked out and landed a blow squarely on the dwarf's breastplate. He stumbled backwards, tripped over a coil of rope and crashed to the deck. The mole was far too heavy for Felix to ever use effectively, and so he cast it to the side, where it thumped onto the deck. He looked around. Men were screaming in pain as a dozen enemy warriors moved through them, their heavy armor easily turning aside the sailors' cutlasses. The smell of burning tar and wood smoke hung thick in the air, making Felix's lungs burn and the skin smart. He cast about desperately for Karagul, and spotted it lying on the deck close to the railing. He hesitated. Should he go for the weapon or for the book? He had a split second to make the decision, and in the end he couldn't let his journal burn. The siege of Prague was contained in that book. It couldn't go up in flames. Forgetting about the sword, he dashed towards the fire and snatched up the backpack, beating at the flames with his red Sudaland wool cloak. The pack was ruined, of course, and his quill singed beyond recognition. But the ink of jar, although hot to the touch, was whole, and the journal safe within its oiled leather carrying case. He tucked them into a pouch on his cloak and then cast about for the sword, but it was nowhere to be seen. Had it slid off the deck and into the ocean? The thought of losing Karagul made his heart twinge. The blade had been at his side for many adventures and it felt like a part of him. Losing it would be like having an arm chopped off. Even worse, he thought. He had two arms, but there was only one Karagul. He felt, more than heard, displaced air against his cheek, and dodged backwards just in time to avoid the hammer blow. The armored dwarf he knocked down just before stepped out of the flames. You just don't quit, do you? asked Felix in frustration. The warrior shrugged. I am a dwarf, he said, by way of explanation. Alone and still unarmed, Felix cursed his luck. Why hadn't he gone for the sword? He looked around for help, but the battle had moved away from them, and if there were any sailors still alive, he couldn't see them. He didn't stand a chance. Just as the dwarf stepped in for the killing blow, a snarling figure emerged from the flames and hurled itself at Felix's opponent. Bare-chested and tattooed, Gotrick Gurnison batted aside the mole with his rune axe and lashed out with a ham-hock fist. It impacted the dwarf's armored jaw with a metallic clang which sent him crashing to the deck. Gotrick didn't even bother shaking his hand after the blow. Ah, barely out of port and you decide to burn down the ship around me. Good to see you too, Gotrick, said Felix. The pig grease that the slayer used to shape his hair into a crest had partially melted and smeared his skull and forehead. His skin was an angry red from the heat, almost as red as his fiery beard. He clutched the rune axe tightly in one hand, and in the other, a sword? Gotrek grunted and then held out a weapon, pommel first. It was Karagul. You wouldn't be much good to me without a sword. Felix's heart sang as he took the blade, feeling again its perfect balance and heft. He genuinely thought he lost it. Gotrek? he said. Save it, responded the dwarf gruffly. He looked down at the fallen warrior. Now, what kind of dwarf attacks an unarmed man? He knelt in front of the armored warrior and ripped off his helmet with one hand 
revealing a heavyset dwarf with features that look like they'd been chiseled in stone. Dark eyes and a large craggy nose framed a black beard bound into a warrior's braid and thick golden clips. Vabur Nerenson, said Godric with a curse. You know him? asked Felix, stunned. Of course I know him, said Godric. He is a reckoner out of Barak Var. If Vabur is here, then that means... Nori Wolfheim, come out and face me, you coward! Dark shapes stepped in the flames. Their leader wore mail and an open-faced horn helmet that flaunted a thick white beard. He was flanked by two soldiers of identical height and build, each leveling black powder rifles. Their armor, too, was identical, except that one helmet was molded in the shape of a lion and the other an eagle. Godrek Gurnison, called the dwarf with the white beard. Wolfheim, Felix guessed. You are under arrest in the name of King Brynolf Grundadrak. Just as he finished speaking, a burning spar above them cracked and popped, littering the group with ash and charred rigging. The Reckoner paid no attention to it. Single-minded to the point of razor-like focus, he seemed to be unaware that they were standing in the middle of an inferno. What's the charge? said Felix. Wolfheim's gaze found his, and Felix was suddenly embarrassed to have spoken. He felt like a child who broke the silence in one of Sigmar's temples. Treason, Wolfheim answered, eyes glittering in the firelight. Treason? The pair were guilty of a lot of crimes, but as far as Felix could remember, they never committed treason against the king of Barak Var. Could Wolfheim be pursuing them because of some crime Gatra committed before he found Felix? But that was two decades ago. Just how long were these dwarves had been pursuing him? Your king was the one who committed treason, Nori, and you know it, growled Gotrek. Wolfheim continued as if Gotrek hadn't even spoken. And if that wasn't enough, common fevery. Felix felt his jaw clench. Gotrek hunched his shoulders and took a step towards Wolfheim, prompting the twin warriors to tighten their grips on their rifles. After a visible struggle, Gotrek regained control of his temper. Felix had seen him deflect arrows before with the runax, but charging two dwarf warriors with rifles leveled was madness, even for him. It was the goal of every slayer to die gloriously, not anonymously at the hands of a couple of reckoners with rifles. Explain yourself, Nori Wolfheim, growled Gotrek. I've been called a traitor before, but never a thief. Before the Reckoner could elaborate, a low thumping groan came from the bow, and the crack of split wood rent the air once more. Though the dwarves were unmoved, Felix stumbled and nearly fell as the ship's deck lurched. As he regained his footing, he spotted two longboats already in the water, rowing frantically to the shore. The crew had abandoned ship, and for good reason. He could see the sea pouring over the Dorabella's stern as she finally began to sink. Can we hurry this up a little? he asked nervously. Ocean water swept up the deck towards them, and Felix noticed with some distress that the stern of the ship was almost completely submerged. When would these blasted dwarves get to the point? Do you plan to take us prisoner or carry out the sentence right here? Because if it's the latter, the sea will soon beat you to it. I am not permitted to discuss the details of your crimes in front of an umgi, said Nori Wolfheim to Godrek, eyeing Felix suspiciously. This manling is my rememberer and the dwarf friend. Anything you need to say to me, you can say to him, replied Godrek. How do you merit a rememberer? asked one of the twin warriors in surprise. He was quickly silenced by a stern look from Wolfheim. Annoyed, the Reckoner turned back to Godrek. You're already aware of why you're wanted for treason, he said, his face stony and unpredictable. As for theft, the vault of Moose in Baldurk has been breached, 
You lie, sneered Godric, with such ferociousness that the twins cocked their rifles. I built that vault myself. It would take a dozen dwarves with a barrel of black powder the size of this ship more than a week to get in. If you let that happen, then there's no help I can offer you. For the first time since they'd met, Nori Wolfheim lost his composure. His cheeks reddened and his beard twitched. Are you accusing me of incompetence? Come on, manling, said Godric, lowering his axe and stomping towards the three reckoners. Felix took a few hesitant steps after Godric, still unsure what had happened. One minute it looked like the Slayer was determined to go down with the ship, and the next he was, well, if not surrendering, then at least agreeing to terms. Where are we going? Godric's single eye glittered. To Barak Var. I want to see for myself how these fools let someone into my vault. Despite the immense amount of dwarf technology that went into the construction of a vehicle that could go on for days beneath the waves, Felix couldn't help but think they were traveling inside a floating dungeon. Since space inside what Gatra called the Nautilus was at a premium, everything was sized for a dwarf, and Felix was forced to crouch in the narrow passageways. His back hurt the instant he set foot in the vessel and heard even more when he considered that it might take weeks of travel to reach Barakvar. They were led along a narrow passageway, down what Felix assumed was the throat of the giant copper fish. They passed rooms filled with narrow bunks and a small infirmary where a few dwarves were being treated for minor burns sustained in the inferno above. The entire vessel smelled like lamp oil, only heavier and more pungent. Once, Felix put down his hand in what he thought was a guardrail, only to have it come away covered in grease. They turned onto a metal gangplank made from wire mesh that allowed Felix to see into the inner workings of the vessel. It was like staring into a clock. A tangle of gears and pipes turned an enormous shaft that disappeared towards the stern of the vessel. The air here smelled of oil and what the dwarfs called black water. It was a pleasant smell, but one that Felix knew better than to inhale deeply. Wolfheim led them down the gangplank to a small windowless cell in the back of the submersible. It had probably once held provisions, judging from the stink of rotten potatoes that hung in the air. A few smokeless lamps gave the room a yellowish pall, and strange copper pipes that were hot to the touch skirted the ceiling. At first, these made the cramped cell unbearably hot. But as the Nautilus descended into the depths, the walls grew cold, and Felix began to think that the ship designers had placed them there deliberately to keep the occupants warm. The Slayer had told Nori that he was coming to Barakvar as an engineer, not a Slayer. But Felix couldn't help that a vault of Musin Baldurk was but the smallest part of it. His mind kept going back to the charge of treason. Dwarves were a stubborn bunch, and valued loyalty above all else. Felix had studied at the University of Aldorf, and he could count the number of dwarves accused of treason on one hand and still not use all the fingers. But despite the seriousness of the charge, Godric had said nothing in all the years they traveled together. Felix couldn't keep his gaze away from the Slayer's fiery crest and body tattoos. Could Wolfheim have been hunting Godric for the very crime that caused him to take the Slayer oath? Despite Felix's attempts at conversation, he would not speak of it. A few days later, he wouldn't speak at all, merely staring darkly at a spot on the opposite wall. With a sigh, Felix opened the journal, bit an edge into his singed quill, and put ink to page. He found precious little writing time on the road, and had not yet written of the death of Arek Demonclaw and the events that followed. The days passed quickly and he lost track of how long they were at sea. Guards came twice a day to empty their chamber pot and feed them a thin but nourishing gruel. Though Felix had no way to tell time from the confines of the cell, mealtimes were so regular he could predict them by the grumbling of the stomach. By the time he noticed a change in the constant hum that Godric had explained came from the ship engines, he had filled forty pages. Soon afterwards, the ship lurched and a dull, metallic thump echoed through the ship hull.
The hatch's handle spun and it hissed open. Nori Wolfame stepped over the threshold, still in full armor. Felix suspected that he actually slept in it. Finally muster enough courage to come face me without your henchman, Wolfhame, sneered Gotrak. The pair were technically prisoners, but no one had been brave enough to relieve Gotrak of his weapon. Wolfhame eyed it warily and fingered his hammer, but he did not draw it. We've docked under the palace. From here we will be proceeding directly to the king's private chambers via a secret route. Though it is supposed to be reserved for the king's private use, some members of the palace staff have been known to use it on occasion, and if we should encounter them, you will remain silent. Should you utter the slightest sound, my men will kill you where you stand. Felix rose slowly, feeling every ache and pain of a long voyage in a cramped space. He was disappointed to hear that they'd already docked. Last time they'd been in Barakvar, they'd been aboard a Bredonian merchantman, and seen firsthand the huge sea cave in which it was situated. He'd been looking forward to seeing such a marvel again. Lanterns the size of a carriage strung to the ceiling with huge chains had set fire to the perfectly still ocean and highlighted the busy harbor beyond. It was only when he stood on the deck of the Nautilus that he realized the true magnitude of what Wolfheim had said. Unlike the harbor of Barakvar, this was nothing more than an enclosed gorge, which had been enlarged just barely enough to accommodate the Nautilus. Wolfheim's pilot must have incredible mastery of the vessel to pilot it between the narrow walls. No crates or supplies lined the docks, making it obvious to Felix that the harbor only served one purpose, to bring people in and out of the palace in secret. Dwarves were such a pragmatic breed that, even though Wolfheim had told them that the dock was reserved for kingly use, it was undecorated. He glanced at Godrek as the Slayer followed the Reckoners up a rough-cut stairway and then to a secret passage. What was the need for such secrecy? He wished he could ask Godrek if he knew what was going on, but Vabur Nerinson, the black-bearded dwarf that the Slayer had felled in a single punch, marched only a few feet away. His giant mole was slung over one shoulder and he carried his dented helmet under one arm. Every time he caught Felix's eye, he smiled evilly and petted the weapon. Better to stay silent than to give that one an excuse to soothe his wounded pride on Felix's back. The walls of the passage were unmarked, and the ascent so steep that Felix had to concentrate on keeping up with the hardy dwarves. Soon he was sweating and breathing heavily. He longed to spot some kind of sign that would mark their progress, a floor number, or at the very least, another exit. But the walls were plainly cut stone, and there was no door in sight. Finally, they emerged into a wide hallway. In contrast to the corridor they just left, this construction was superb. Intricate carvings graced the walls, and several stone busts of past kings sat on a set of pedestals that ran the length of the hallway. Wilhelm led them deliberately to the huge oaken doors marking the entrance to King Grundadrak's chambers. Half a dozen advisors were gathered around a large oaken table, upon which rested a map of the lower tunnels as large as a bedsheet. Thumb-sized stone figures dotted the map, some carved to look like iron breakers, while other more crudely carved like ratmen. Felix could identify Grundadrak immediately, despite never having met him. Completely bald, with a flowing white beard that stretched nearly to his belt buckle, he towered above his advisors. Even bent over the tunnel map as he was, Felix could tell that he was as large or even larger than Godrek, maybe even as wide as Nori Nosebiter. He was a giant among dwarves. Your Majesty, said Wolfheim as they entered, I brought you Godrek Gurnison, the troll slayer. The king carefully picked a stone figure and then circled the map and placed it at a different spot. He surveyed it, checked its relationship to the other carvings, its distance, its height, and only then looked up with a frown. He still has his axe. Just let the dwarf who wants to take it come forward, said Godrek, grinning evilly. 
and running a thumb up its blade until he drew blood. I should have you executed, said the king nonchalantly. Having placed the ratman where he wanted it, he rose and then turned towards them, judging them at a glance. This grim brotherhood nonsense, he said, waving his finger at Gotrek's tattoos and crest, has never impressed me. There are those, even among my advisors, who believe that the oath absolves one of all their crimes. This is false. It is just that slayers usually have the good sense to die before the sentence can be carried out. Are you saying I've been avoiding my doom? Gotrek asked, voice low and dangerous. Felix could sense the air in the room grow cold. The advisors of Grundadrak drew away from the king unconsciously, clearing the space between them. Only one venerable dwarf stayed at the king's side. He was stocky, sporting a belly that overhung his belt. He wore jewelry in the manner of the richest merchant princes, one who fought wars in the marketplace and not on the battlefield. Each finger glimmered with a jeweled ring, and he wore a thin silver band across his forehead. His forked beard was immaculately oiled, and his skin free of blemishes. Though Felix admired his courage, Gotrek would cut right through him on the way to the king, unless Felix did something to defuse the situation. Why have you, uh, summoned us, your majesty? He asked quickly, and then gulped when he saw all eyes turn towards him. Far from defusing the situation, he turned their anger upon himself. Drumnok, said the king to the oiled merchant prince. Who is this Umgi? Unless I miss my guess, he is Felix Jaeger, your majesty, said the merchant prince. Dwarf friend and rememberer to Godric Gernison. Felix was surprised that Drumnok identified him so easily. Had news of their deeds spread so far? You have impressive sources, my lord. Drumnok shook his head. Just Drumnok, I am no thane, merely an ale merchant who's done well for himself. But to answer your question, we've been pursuing Gotra Gernison for more years than you've been alive. It was only prudent we compile a list of known associates. Felix flushed. Of course. It would take years for news of their part in the Siege of Prague to filter down from the north, if it ever did. In most parts of the Empire, they were far from heroes. In fact, they were still wanted criminals. It was a blow to his ego to be known merely as Gotrek's accomplice, but he supposed it fit. Where is the book, Trollslayer? asked the king, his attention shifting back to Gotrek like a lion picking a sheep to devour. He picked up another figurine, a crudely carved skaven, and traced its contours with his thumb. Book? asked Gotrek. You brought me back here because of a book? Don't play with me, Trollslayer, said the king. I've not forgotten what you did. Slayer and king glared at each other with hatred pure and cold. Felix felt certain that Godric had at last met his match, at least in stubbornness. The Book of Grudges. Drumnok stepped forward, knowing, like any good merchant, when to break an impasse. It went missing from the vault of Musin Baldurk under the very noses of my personal guard. And what problem is that of mine? asked Godric sullenly. No problem at all, said Drumnok, steepling his fingers. Except that the vault was untouched, not a mark on it. My finest engineers went over it inch by inch and couldn't determine how the theft was committed. Only one dwarf could open the vault and not leave a trace, the engineer who designed it. Felix felt his stomach sink. All the secrecy that had shrouded their visit suddenly made sense. The Book of Grudges was one of the most sacred artifacts in a dwarf hold. 
In it was written every wrong that had ever been committed against a particular clan for thousands of years. Each new grudge was written into the book in the king's own blood, and it was considered a mark of personal triumph for a monarch to extract justice for a past grievance and finally cross a grudge of the list. Without the book, the king couldn't show his face in public. There was no telling how the hold would react should they learn of its disappearance. Wolfheim's threat to kill them, should they utter a word to a member of the palace staff, had obviously not been a joke. Grundadra could do anything to keep knowledge of the theft from leaking out. The only reason they were still alive was that he believed they had something to do with it. I've been penned in these quarters for a month, troll slayer, said the king, banging his fist on the table so hard that the stone figures jumped. My subjects are beginning to forget what I look like. I don't care if you stole the book or your faulty design allowed it to be stolen. You owe me a book, and I want it back. Instead of getting angry, Godric lapsed into silence. It was one thing to question his ability as a slayer, but it was another to question his skill as an engineer. He took the former personally, but he took the latter as a challenge. He was, in all likelihood, mentally reviewing plans he'd memorized decades ago, looking for flaws. Did no one else have access to the vault? asked Felix. No one, said Drumnock firmly. No, said Gotrek. There was another, my former apprentice, Malbach Drumnockson. Oh, how convenient, sneered the king. Malbach is the one who accused you of the theft. Convenient for whom, your majesty? Felix asked pointedly. Two dwarfs had access to the vault, and one of them was a thousand leagues away when the crime was committed. Grundadrak's eyes narrowed and he turned to Drumnock. Your son says he has evidence that the troll slayer was the culprit. He swears it, your majesty, replied Drumnock firmly. Grundadrak considered this for a while, and then finally set the Skaven carving back on the map. You know I've always been grateful to you for your counsel, my friend, he said to Drumnock. But the Umgi raises a valid point. It is difficult for even the best of thieves to commit a crime when they are a thousand leagues away. Drumnock reddened and his belly shook indignantly. Your Majesty, I... Clear every corridor from here to the vault, said King Grundadrak to Wolfheim, who nodded smartly. And have Malbach Dromnaxon meet us there. It is time for us to get to the bottom of this. They took the same hidden passage they'd used to come from the harbor. The king was big enough that his bulk nearly filled the corridor and he cursed fate richly for necessitating to use the infernal passageway. When they traveled roughly halfway back to the docks, Nori Wolfheim stopped in what appeared to be the middle of an empty hallway, and opened a hit her to unseen door that led to another set of corridors to the vault area. Felix wondered just how extensive the network of secret passageways was. It appeared to him that Baragvar was riddled with them. Malbach Dromnaxon met them in front of a massive stone door. Short, even for a dwarf, he looked nothing like his father, except for the rapidly developing paunch he tried to keep hidden under a leather girdle. His beard was as red as the wispy hair that grew out of his ears and not his head. He wore a thick golden chain around his neck and sparkling earrings around his ears. Godric grunted and told Felix that no member of Malbach's line could bear to be parted from the precious metal even for a day, which explained Drumnock's occupation as a merchant, and his son's as a vault engineer. Malbach was breathing heavily, as if he had to jog to meet them at the vault. "'Your Majesty, I—' he said, beginning a bow that was arrested when he saw Godric. "'You!' he said, voice loaded with hatred. You should be dead. Godric grinned a toothy smile that showed the yellow stumps he called teeth. 
God's willing. Malbach, barked Drumnock sternly. You forget yourself in front of the king. Malbach looked properly chastised, turning and completing the bow he had started earlier. Your majesty, it's always an honor to have you grace the vaults. And it's always a pain in the neck to come down here, grunted the king. Despite his size and relative health, Felix could tell that the king was feeling his age. Do you think that before the Skaven attacked, we used to store most of this stuff several levels lower? The Skaven, my lord? asked Felix, trying to hide his disgust. The world's most prolific thieves arrive, and everyone was surprised when there was a theft. There had to be more to this. I know what you're thinking, Herr Jäger, said Drumnock reprovingly. The Skaven may have attacked the lower levels, but they have come nowhere close to here. In fact, much of the treasure in the lower vaults was brought here specifically because this vault was deemed impregnable. After all, it was built by one of the Barak's most capable engineers, and Gotra Gurnison. Malbach and his father exchanged satisfied looks, but if Godric caught the slight, he ignored it. He tapped a finger to his lips as he studied the vault door. Open it, he said softly. Grundadrak ignored the lack of a title and simply nodded at Malbach. The younger engineer removed a golden chain from around his neck from which dangled a large key. He moved towards the door and began to hum a deep and complex melody as he traced his finger across a string of runes. One by one, the runes lit up, until the flickering blue light illuminated a keyhole. Mulbach inserted the key into the lock, turned it, and then stepped away. Somewhere inside, the smooth stonework, huge gears ground together, and huge weights thunked into place, and the door was open. Felix was amazed by the thickness of the stone. Made out of solid bedrock, it could have weighed hundreds of tons, and yet it was so perfectly balanced, a child could have pushed it shut. Although the inside of the vault was no bigger than the room in which they sat at the purple sheep, there was more wealth inside than Felix had ever seen before. Gold ingots piled as high as a dwarf could stand tall. Jewels the size of a clenched fist set in sterling silver necklaces a rack of unfathomably ancient scrolls, and the empty lectern where he guessed the Book of Grudges once rested. Felix had never felt that much desire for wealth, but looking upon the contents of that vault, he felt a stirring in his chest that the dwarfs could call gold lust. Karl Franz himself would weep over the treasure laid before them, but Felix guessed there were many more vaults just like this, hidden in the expanses of Barak Var. Godrek surveyed the treasure critically, as if he was weighing the contents of the vault. At last, he stirred. I need four dwarves to help me empty it. Empty it? King Grundadrak nearly popped a vein. It took weeks just to move it here. Drumnock hurried forward, gently placing a hand on Godrek's shoulder, and then yanking it back when Godrek glared at him. The vault of Moose in Balderk shelters some of the Barak's most precious artifacts, not to mention state secrets. We can't simply store it in the antechamber. Fine, said Godrek, crossing his arms and leaning casually against the door. Find the book yourselves, then. Wolfheim, said the king between clenched teeth. Order your men to help the slayer empty the vault. 